about a mile outside on the northern side of Carrick Fergus and I've come down a wee side road here and there's an American flag flying and I'm at a very very interesting spot because this building here houses the exhibition detailing the life and parents of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. And in behind the cottage is a significant exhibition if you're interested in the uh, Second World War and I'll hopefully get a look around it as well. It's the U.S. Rangers Museum. U.S. Rangers uh, inaugurated in Northern Ireland in 1942. And the U.S. Rangers are, you know, they're one of the top elite American uh, units. These are old ploughs, horse pulled ploughs. From White West Cottage to White House, it's not good. And then in round the back is the Rangers, US Rangers uh, Museum exhibition as White collection of uniforms, photographs, documents and other material relating to the Ranger battalions which were donated by members of the original Ranger unit stationed in Carrick Fergus. Well, this is what I like to see. Admission free. Now you need to watch the admission of this place. You need to watch this or you'll arrive down here and it'll be shut. It's only open Wednesday through to Sunday and that's 11 a.m. to 3 a, a PM tours available outside normal and there's the phone numbers if you want to contact and be absolutely 100% sure and I'm just outside the US Ranger Museum and this whole um, Andrew Jackson Cottage and Ranger Museum is run and uh, administered and funded by uh, Carrick Fergus Council, so good on them, good on them. And just beyond the, the Ranger Museum is Kilroot Power Station, and Kilroot is is where Jonathan Swift, a uh, writer of Gulliver's Travels, came to be rector all those years ago. You can look him up. But I'm here to talk about the Ranger Museum. These trees actually were planted by a guy who's a Choctaw Red Indian. So this is the US Rangers exhibition. This plaque commemorates the official opening of the US Rangers Center by Bob Reid. And this is where the US Rangers This is their sort of spiritual home. The US Ranger Battalions were inaugurated as such just up the road here at Swinelands. And this is unique uh, for an uh, American uh, Rangers, American forces to to have this uh, name on f being taken on foreign soil. So American forces were big in number here and I'm just going to scoop flan down here. And this is where Darby's Rangers came into being. 
Darby's Rangers. I used to watch Darby's Rangers on the TV. And James uh, Garner, who used to play Maverick, he was one of Darby's Rangers. US troops arriving in Belfast between January and May brought glamour and, and all the rest of it. When the call came to join the, the newly created US Ranger battalions, the volunteers came in all shapes and sizes. Among them was Private Bob Reed from Canandaigua, New York, whose mother's family came from County Wicklow, and Private First Class Thomas or Tom S. Sullivan. Or recounted how the uh, whole population turned out to greet them. And this guy, Bob Reed, has been back here with about 14 or 16 rangers from that time who were here. And this is uh, the lead up to the rangers formation. And it's all here, folks. And I, I, I can't read it for you because there's so much of it. Uh, proud tradition of the Rangers, name of this elite fighting force finds its roots in Rogers Rangers, a company of late infantry soldiers who were responsible for special operations behind the enemy lines in, in the French and Indian Wars in North America, 1754 to 63. Germany, Nazi Germany was on the ascendancy in 1944 and American troops came to help beleaguered UK. And there's commando training camp at Aknakara, and there's the Sunnylands estate, and there's American forces all doing their drill. And you see this, this the booklet here, this is a, one of the booklets that was given to all American soldiers whenever they came in to uh, Northern Ireland. Basically, it is a roundup of the do's and don'ts that uh, that you don't do and do do um, in conversation with locals. And the American forces who produced this were very au fait with uh, differences in culture and, st and stuff like that. And I have heard about this this book, but I had never seen one. Differences in language <laughs> and various uh, pictures. Look at that. And the girls, Ireland is a world uh, is an old world where women's place is still to a considerable extent in the home. So, so we're talking about social attitudes and dealing with uh, the members of the fair sex. So the, the American soldiers were warned about this. Anyway. General Lucien Truscott, who activated the 1st uh, Rangers Battalion and placed it under the command of uh, Major William Darby. These were so. So the American Rangers were inaugurated in in uh, just outside Carrick Fergus. Isn't that amazing? It, it's the only uh, unit. And the American forces to be inaugurated on foreign soil. How's the boys doing? Uh, commando exercises, fast and furious training, all s stuff. And these were like uh, like uh, um, the UK commandos. There's a letter home. And you can read that for yourself. And this is the type of uh, gear that these each of these boys would have had. A Springfield rifle first used by US forces in World War One. It remained in service and standard issue infantry rifle during World War Two and even in the Korean War and the early Vietnam. And a leather belt and the infantry cap. 
and that's for gas. The mother of all raids to Dieppe. I'll get the get the various operations here. And then I'll come down to the the display below. You just have to see this for yourself. Onward we stagger, and if tanks come, may God help the tanks. Oh, very good. Let us see, you get this uh, various uh, badges of the, uh, the Rangers. Training schedules. Small American flag was uh, carried by Bob Reed in his top pocket throughout every battle he encountered. There's the pocket gate to Northern Ireland. These hikes give me a pain in my canteen. Nurse letters home. Fountain pen used to write letters home. Bible kept by Bob Reed throughout World War Two, and I believe his uh, daughter and grandchildren are going to be visiting here uh, quite soon. What's that? General Eisenhower thought of the jacket as part of the combat dress. That's why he got um, rid of the gilded buttons and the pockets added, which were big enough for ammunition boxes. And it's a Nike jacket. Isn't that interesting? This would be formal gear, I would imagine. Soldier in trousers known as an officer's pinks. He's also wearing his winter service shirt. Badges tell us the jacket belonged to a staff sergeant. This is a fabulous place and there's flags. There's the, the ranger flag in behind. Pocket flaps were removed from the field jackets and shoulder loops added. This soldier is wearing the flannel winter service uh, shirt and tan tie gaiters which were used to protect the soldier's legs below the knees have been blackened. Metal fittings and his helmet has a fibre lining. There's another uniform. An example of the classic olive drab flannel shirt made from herringbone twill, a robust fabric which performed well in tough conditions, being comfortable. And this kind of uniform <coughs> material superseded, it was just far far better than what uh, the British Tommy got. And the German uniforms were very very good as well, comfortable and warm. Tank crew and mechanics in the army wore herringbone twill overalls. They proved to be popular replacement for the inadequate original issue uniform because it was tough and durable. More like iron. And there's a wire recorder and lid. So the American Ranger, US Rangers, look to Carrick Fergus as their founding place. That's a place of what you might call a pilgrimage. There's Derby. This is talking about Derby. Where is he? Uh, right, there he is. That's the train going by. <coughs> That's all about uh, Colonel William O'Darby. 
and that's all his uh, honours. Two days before the end of the war in Italy, the fearless and brilliant Colonel Darby was killed by a piece of shrapnel from a German artillery piece. After the war, he was buried near his home in Fort Smith, Arkansas. 15th of May 1946, President Truman promoted Darby's posthumously to the rank of Brigadier General. Darby remains a legend to this day and continues to be a role model for the Rangers. As his executive officer, Major Herman Dahmer, observed, Darby's optimism and confidence was the source of the Ranger spirit, which translated in a, it into which translated into it can be done. There you go. And that's percentages of uh, rangers who uh, were killed. And this is talking about this guy, um, Jim Altieri. And there's talking about James Garner. Um, which inspired the film of the same name starring James Garner. Altieri published another history of the Rangers, the Spearheaders, in 1960. Altieri retained close links to Carrick Fergus until his death in 2008 at the age of 88. Uh, there's so much to film here. I'll come down to the the glass panel below here in a minute. No, I hope you can see that in the, the light. It's maybe not too good. So this is talking about uh, Phil Stern. After the war, Stern worked as a freelance photographer and served as a special still cameraman on numerous films like West Side Story and Guys and Dolls. Oh, I've heard of these places. <laughs> I, watched I watched Derby's Rangers on the TV as a boy. Camp Morel, I remember that. And Fort Benning. Today, Rangers training takes place in three parts. Soldiers start in Fort Benning in Georgia and then their assess after their assessment includes a derby chase before progressing to mountain and swamp phases. And here's various uh, memorabilia, weapons and whatnot. US Rangers commemorative knife. And there it is. And then various badges. selection of medals awarded to the Rangers in World War II. This is a fabulous exhibition. It's a small printed photograph of a letter from William Darby to his mother dated 10th of March 1944. This is all personal effects of William Darby, the founder of the Rangers. I'll go from the top to the bottom. I just love this history. And I presume this is what a Ranger might look like today. In 2015, two women became, made history by becoming the first female Rangers. You know, it would be a tough nut, I would imagine. <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't be there, I'm afraid. Rangers fight on. The end of World War II meant the end of the six Ranger battalions and Merrill's Marauders. Remember them? A unit of similar combat style who drew inspiration from the original Rangers. Their legacy is enshrined in the scrolls and their of their insignia and it wouldn't be long before the specific skills of the Rangers had developed to be called into action again. New Rangers Regiment 1948, outbreak of hostilities in Korea 1950, 
Rangers found uh, later fought in global conflicts in Vietnam, Iraq, or Afghanistan, where their hit and run style and guerrilla warfare tactics continued to be an effective weapon in the front line. Rangers lead the way. And here's the Rangers' creed. This is marvellous. There's more memoirs of his life. This is more of uh, of uh, Bob Reed. And his his after story. Uh, after war story. Returned in nineteen ninety two for the opening of this museum in uh, in 1994, contributing many artefacts from his time as a ranger to this exhibition. Died uh, 2004, 86. And this is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Roy Murray. And there are some of the ranger veterans. And this is um, a commemoration stone at Sunnylands which I hope to go on video and this is just down the road somewhere I'll have to find it these were these boys made history he was as fast as a deer and as tough as nails <laughs> Roy Murray famous US Ranger And they came together at Carrick Fergus. That's amazing. There's Darby. Colonel William Orlando Darby, Darby with some of his men of the 1st Battalion. U.S. Rangers activated here in Carrick Fergus on the 19th of June 1942. Today we celebrate those men, what they did for all of us and the unshakable bond between America and our great town that was forged through that fight for freedom. And there's a display here which I will not stick on. 1992, people of Carrick Fergus opened their arms to uh, Jim Materi, Bob Reid and 12 other Ranger veterans from World War II who were thrilled to be back when it all began, back in the place they referred to as the Rangers' Holy Land. Isn't that amazing? The visit highlighted the significance which the Rangers and Carrick Fergus had for each other and from that day the first steps were taken to create a permanent mu uh, museum in recognition. These were veterans, all the names that returned for that commemoration. And sir, so here's some of the guys. In fact, all of the guys. Not too sure of the significance of the, uh, the picture there. This is there's um, there's Bob Reed there, the guy with the, the beard. And that's at the opening of this exhibition centre. And there's there's various tours. Um, this is one that I haven't come across. This is Lead the Way Tour. And I'm going to take one of those. Oh, brilliant. I've got to discuss. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. There's another one, the Northern Ireland War Memorial. Well, I know about it. 
and here's people's notes that uh, they've, they've, uh, they've uh, left wee messages and boys from USA, Canada, Australia, Derby in England, Lincoln University USA and as I always say folks you have to come and see this for yourself. And these were some of the men who signed up for the, for the Rangers up here. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Love it. But when the dangers came, the men were game, their boldness always standing. Derby's Rangers poem by Jim Altieri. Isn't it strange to think that this wee spot in Northern Ireland has so much significance. And I have had a fabulous time visiting the Andrew Jackson Exhibition Cottage and the US Rangers birthplace. Come and see this place for yourself. I'm just about a quarter of a mile outside Carrick Fergus and I've headed up towards Sunny Lands Avenue and Sunny Lands Estate and this is the commemorative stone tribute to the US Ranger Battalions who served in Northern Ireland before going off to fight in the Second World War over in mainland Europe. Commemorate the founding of the US Ranger Battalions activated at Sunnylands Camp Carrick Fergus 19th of June 1942 under the command of Major William O'Darby, thus giving birth to their long and illustrious tradition in the service of freedom, keeping bright the torch of liberty. Rangers lead the way, erected by Carrick Fergus brother, Borough Council, 25th of September 1992. a big big housing estate on the outskirts of Carrick Fergus and there's the town centre with the spa and there's the railway just so that you know